Hello, my name is Glenn Hall and today is October 24th, 2022. This video is called The Obedience of Faith. It's part two of a new series that I'm calling The Prophecies of the Scriptures. Before I begin uh, delving into what I have planned for today, I want to ask a couple of questions of you. <clears throat> What is the purpose of the scriptures? Or another way of asking that is, who were the scriptures written to? If you were to go into most of our churches these days, you would think that the sole purpose of scripture was to get people saved, to get people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah that Jesus is our Savior, that He is our God. I would say I, I've probably heard at least a hundred salvation sermons in church, if not more. And I'm sure you have too, if you've gone to church. But is that what most of the scriptures are about? Getting you to believe? in Jesus? Well, let's look at a few beginnings of uh, some books. The letter of Paul to the Romans. He identifies himself. And then in verse 7, chapter 1, verse 7, he says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, called to be Kodeshim, called to be holy ones. So in Romans, he specifically is writing to people who are called, who already are considered to be saints. And then 1 Corinthians, he identifies himself in chapter or verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, and then verse 2, he says, to the ecclesia of God, our Bibles say the church of God, but it's the called out ones of God that are in Corinth. So again, he's writing already to the church, to the ecclesia. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the ecclesia of God that is in Corinth with all the Kodeshim who are in the whole of Achaia. So there's three books, every one written to the Kodeshim, to the Holy Ones, to the people of God. The letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 1. Verse 2. To the churches of Galatia to the Ecclesia of Galatia. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, to the Kodeshim, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Philippians, book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 1, to all the Kodeshim in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, Next book, Colossians, verse 2. To the Kodeshim and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 1. To the Ecclesia of the, of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, verse 1. To the Ecclesia of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then let's go to, to uh, the book of Hebrews. Chapter 3, verse 1. Paul, or it is not Paul, actually, who wrote Hebrews. And we'll discuss that at length uh, soon. But... Uh, 
Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, holy brothers, or therefore Kodeshim, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So again, he's writing, this writer is writing to the Kodeshim. And then let's turn to the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. And then down in verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4 of Revelation, John, he identifies himself as the writer. This is the beloved disciple. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, or to the seven ecclesia, the seven groups of called out ones that are in Asia. So we see that in the scripture, there you go, the Holy Bible, English Standard Version. In the scripture, the scriptures specifically say that they are written to the Kodeshim, to the Holy Ones. So what does that mean? That means that rather than teaching us over and over and over again that Jesus is the Christ, what these scriptures are doing are telling those who already believe how to live. They're giving us instruction. And that's how we need to see the scriptures. They're written to believers. They're written to people who know their God. Now it is also true that a person can come to initial faith through the scriptures. That actually happened to me 46 years ago. By reading the scripture, God convinced me that he had written the scriptures through men. The word of God was revealed to me. The word of the Lord was revealed to me. Therefore, because the word was revealed to me, I had faith. And in Romans 10, 17, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's how we do get faith is through the word of God. But it's not just about one time coming to faith. It's faith to faith over and over because the fact is we human beings can easily fall out of faith and especially if we do not remain grounded in the Word of God and that's why it's so important to understand my teaching born of water because you have to continue to wash yourself with the water of the Word of God it's so critical. You have to wash yourself with water. How often do you take a bath? How often do you wash your hands? How often do you wash your face? Hopefully every day, more than once. We need to wash ourselves with the water of the Word daily. And so today I'm going to discuss the obedience of faith. And this is going to be a reading of the book of Romans. This is likely to be the longest video I've ever done because I intend to go through the first eight chapters of the book of Romans today. I don't have anything really written out or planned out to teach you from the book of Romans. I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to stop me at the places where I need to give some instruction about what Paul is saying. I think that Romans, like all of Scripture, is very misunderstood. That um, many people have not understood what Paul is saying. They don't understand his argument. They don't understand really the point 
of Romans. And in fact, unless you've read the first eight chapters all together at one time, you probably do not understand what Romans is about because Paul begins his argument in chapter 1 and he doesn't finish his initial argument, his initial point, until the end of chapter 8. So, let's begin then with the book of Romans, chapter 1. Paul, it'd be good if you had your own Bible. Uh, the English Standard Version is what I'm reading from. So let's just begin here. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So the Holy Scriptures prophetically declare the coming of Jesus. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be Kodeshim, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now have you ever thought about that before? Paul received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of of faith. You know, we, we always hear we're saved by grace through faith, and this not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, and therefore few people think about obeying their faith. In fact, obedience is even a, uh, a curse word to many Christians today. What do you mean obey? I'm saved by grace. I don't have to obey. What do you mean the obedience of faith? Well, let's find out. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, the Gentiles being the nations other than the Jews. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now that is the first citation of an Old Testament scripture that we have here. The righteous shall live by faith. Paul will discuss what this means. Um, I want to encourage you when you read your Bible and you see a scripture that has been referenced from the Old Testament, that you go back to the Old Testament and you read 
the scripture that this comes from. Look at the verses around it, see what the context is, and you will often gain a much better understanding of what the writer in the New Testament is talking about. Now, I do not plan to do that today in a lot of places because I want to focus on the message Paul brings to the Romans. He will discuss this idea of the righteous living by faith quite a bit, though. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Verse 18 says this, again, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. Now it's later in the book of Romans, chapter 10, where Paul references Psalm 19. And I talked about this in the last video I did, when it, the prophecies of the Psalms. And he quotes 19 verse 4 that says, Their voice, talking about the voice of the heavens, their voice goes out through all the earth. See, verse 1 of chapter 19 of Psalms says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. You see, the heavens, the sky, the firmament, have a voice. And the voice proclaims God. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, in the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its seat. Notice this. The sun has a circuit. The sun begins in the east of the world. All day long it travels across the earth and then it sets in the west. That's what this scripture is talking about. And it's also talking about the heavens, all the stars, the planets. But men have suppressed the truth. Hundreds of years ago, they came up with some weird plan to begin convincing men that we live on a, a globe and that our globe is turning and traveling through space. The rulers of this world know that we live on a flat earth. And all of scripture declares that. Either scripture is wrong or science is wrong. But if you look at the science and really examine it, you'll see that it is science that deceives us. And the men who are in charge of science, the men in charge of our universities, suppress the truth. Verse 24, Romans 1, 24. Therefore, because men suppress the truth and make idols, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Believe the science. Believe the science. Do you trust the creature or do you trust your creator? 
Are you going to take the mark of the beast when it occurs? And I believe it has to a large extent and is going to become even to a greater extent. Do you trust the creature or do you trust the creator? Do you trust the science or do you trust what God says about the world he created? For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done, how else can you describe what's going on in the world now? This changing of genders. This inability to call a woman female and a man male. Saying they can decide. No, they can't decide. They are what they are. It's what God created. Male and female, he created them. So God has given men up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Well, that pretty much describes the world we live in, doesn't it? Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. See, the laws they try to pass these days are really laws that promote sin, laws that make sin acceptable. In the past, it was sin that was codified in the law. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Those were codified in law, and we lived in a society based upon the laws of God. That is no longer true. We live in a lawless society now. That is exactly what Paul described here. And now we move into chapter 2. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. Oh my. Boy. I guess all the churches are right. We just, we can't judge sin, can we? Boy, just listen to that verse. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. That's the key. You cannot judge another if you practice evil. That's what Paul is saying here. So he's writing to the called out ones. He's writing to the Kodeshim. He's describing the sins that characterize society. They did then and they do now. And then he's telling these Kodeshim, he's saying, you have no excuse if you judge others and yet you do the same thing. That's what he's saying. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet you do them yourself? Do you suppose you sinning Christian? Do you think Oh, sinful Christian, you who practice these deeds yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Repentance means to turn away from sin. So Paul is writing this to those who haven't yet learned 
to repent of their sins who haven't yet walked away from sin. And this is a sad fact in many churches. Many churches now will even have people who practice these abominations as leaders of their church. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. It has not been revealed yet. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Okay, now we're coming into this whole idea of law and justification. And this is where the church really becomes confused. Well, also, the church takes the proverb the saying, judge not lest you be judged, that Jesus said, and then they make a blanket uh, statement that you can't judge sin. Well, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Verse 12 of chapter 2, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be just justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision, indeed, is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code. And circumcision... Let me read that again. Verse 27, Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now here, Paul is alluding to the new covenant where God will write his law upon our hearts and put them in our minds to obey them. That's the new covenant when God's law is written upon our hearts. 
Chapter 3, then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jews were entrusted with the scriptures. The Jews are the ones who had the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, who spoke the word of God. The Jews are the ones who had the scriptures that the New Testament takes, cites, and then explains what it meant with respect to to the coming of Christ and how people who believe in Christ are now to live. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faith? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the, the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying. Well, there's a lot of slanderers among the churches of God who now say that you can do evil and that God's grace is magnified by the, by the evil. You have grace to sin. Well, that's an offensive doctrine. That's extremely offensive. We do not have grace to sin. Verse 9, chapter 3. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, and here Paul quotes several scriptures, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, poisonous snakes, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the ways of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So all of these were scriptures that Paul just cited from the Old Testament. And you can look those up. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now, that's a critical doctrine, and many of the churches will speak that. They'll say that we are not saved by our works. However, most churches have their own laws. Even if they're not the laws of God, they have their own laws that you need to fulfill in order to be a member in good standing of that church. Even if one of their laws is that a homosexual can be the pastor of the church. If you don't abide by that law, you'll be kicked out of that church. Okay. Verse 20 says, Through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So, in other words, what Jesus did was spoken of in the law and in the books of the prophets and in the Psalms. And the Psalms is one of the books of the prophets. David was a prophet, for example. And so were the sons of Korah and others of the psalmists. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, 
although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The work of Christ applies to all men. That's why so little of the scripture deals with the salvation of our spirit. It's because Jesus died for the spirits of all men. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So it's the blood of Jesus that covers our sins. It's the blood of Jesus that reestablishes a relationship between men and God. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now justified a good definition for that is just as if we had not sinned. So we come into our relationship with God by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice for us. Our faith then is what allows us to have a relationship with God, not our works. I cannot be good enough to maintain a relationship with God. You know, my thoughts, even in one day, will often not be thoughts that would be acceptable by God, just in terms of attitude, in the way I'm thinking about something. You know, we, we simply are not good enough by our actions, by what we do, by our our obedience to particular laws. We cannot be good enough to establish a relationship with God. It's only by the blood of Jesus that we stand in a relationship just as if we had not sinned. Justified. We're justified before God because of Christ. And my faith in that allows me to be able to speak to you today. How could I speak? How could I speak about the things of God if I didn't have faith? Because I would constantly be tormented with, with my own failures, my own inability to be perfect before God. But I don't have to be perfect before God. Christ makes me perfect. It's His righteousness that I depend upon, not my own. But that doesn't mean that I can go out and sin and do what I want with respect to indulging in sinful practices. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. So he will justify the Jews who are circumcised 
and all the nations who are not circumcised by faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. That's the last verse of chapter 3 of Romans. Verse 30. We do not overthrow the law. We uphold the law. That's a critical, critical thing for Christians to understand. Too many people want to nail the law to the tree and say the law doesn't apply to them. They don't have to obey the law. That means they don't they can go out and sin. They don't have to stay away from sins that the law says they have to stay away from. No. Now Paul says that's ridiculous. We uphold the law. Well, I see that I'm already over 40 minutes on this, so I'm going to go ahead and end this video here today. And I will begin the next one with chapter 4 of Romans. I intend to get through uh, chapter 8 at least. It's possible I'll end up doing the whole book now. I don't know. So uh, God bless you. I pray that God will open your ears and your eyes to hear and to understand his word in the name of Jesus I pray amen